on News Radio 830 KGH, Rick about a program. As you know, a central theme of the program are is family. And we talk economic issues uh, quite a bit, as always. And sometimes we kind of get into the big picture stuff and get into, you know, money markets and crime and all this other stuff that uh, conceptually uh, makes a difference. But more importantly, uh, we should spend more time about individual finance, knowledge, and in concert with that, ensuring that our kids are prepared and also possess an understanding and knowledge of uh, basic fundamental finances. And joining us today, Prince Dykes is on air with us. Prince is the author of a book, Wesley Learns to Invest. And uh, as a matter of fact, you were just sharing with me, today's the debut, is that right, Prince? Yes, today is the actual debut debut yep. of the book. I'm um, releasing it here. I've been waiting for a while to release it, so I said, hey, you know, why not release it here? Great there time. You go. Well, congratulations on uh, authoring a, it's got to be a, a, a labor of love, but also at times you just have to sit there and go, now why didn't I do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look at the bright side, I look at it as all as a, a great adventure of, uh, it's been a while for me sitting down and writing and publishing it myself and putting in all the hard work, so I'm glad to right. see it finally here, and I hope the people uh, uh, pick it up and hope they love it. Well, let's, let's start at basics. We have a lot of time together this morning. And first okay. off, a little bit about yourself and where you originally hail from. Originally, I was born in Augusta, Georgia. Um, I was born wow. in Augusta, Georgia and uh, raised in Waynesboro, Georgia, a little small stick town right outside of Augusta, Georgia. Yeah. Uh, raised to my parents. My mom was a, uh, she owned her own preschool, so she uh, taught kids and stuff like that in a local community. Oh. And my dad was a school teacher as well. Uh, I have four older brothers. They live down, uh, uh, my oldest brother is uh, John Dykes. He lives down in uh, Waynesboro, Georgia, still there. My other brother, Dante Dykes, he lives in Augusta. And my other brother, Savannah, he lives in Savannah, Georgia, mm -hmm. the Gregory Dykes. So uh, when I, I left and I joined the military, and when I joined the military, I came in as a logistics specialist. And a logistics specialist learns about finances. So when I when I got there, that's when I, st I, I was introducing the finance there. And when I got introduced into finance during the time I came right out of high school straight into the military. And you know, along the way I earned my associate's degree and I earned my bachelor's degree and I earned my master's in business. And I earned numerous certifications. I hold my Series 65 license, uh, my Series 63 license. I also hold my insurance license as well for life insurance for the state of Hawaii. And I also hold the uh, Hawaii's healthcare and accident insurance license as well. So during all this time, um, I learned about, you know, growing up, my parents, like I told you, they were school teachers, but they wasn't very big on investing. You know, they said, you know, all the financial education I got as a kid was, hey, uh, go off, get a job, save up your money, and stay away from credit cards, and retire one day, and that'll be it. I said, okay, great. Uh, my, my mom passed away in 2003 at the age of 66. So that's why the book is dedicated to her because she, de she devoted her whole life to educating kids and stuff like that. So to honor her, I dedicated the book to her. And she, she passed away in 2013. My dad is still alive, he's 69. And he's retired and he's doing well for himself. But that was that is what worked for them. You know, he was a school teacher for 30 years and retired and uh, he was part of the military reserves and he retired as well. He's an old Vietnam veteran. Mm -hmm. And that's what worked for him, it was great. Mm -hmm. So when I got older, you know, I, did, I, I followed the instructions, I stayed away from credit cards, I didn't have any debt, I was saving up money, but I was wondering like, man, what else is, am I, am I missing something? Because I was like, well, I wonder what it, once you don't have debt, what are you supposed to do next? So my first supervisor told me, hey, you should get into investing. You're a young man, you know, you should look into investing. And I had no clue about it because, you know, we're missing that in school. You know, in school and economics, I know what supply and demand is and, you know, basic economics, but nobody really teaches you what is a stock and what is a bond, how you invest, and over time, you know, what is a, a ETF and the indexes and stuff like that. I just didn't know. I heard of a savings account, I heard of a CD, I heard of a money market account. So I said, okay, well, I just put my money to the money market and it was just sitting there. And in 2008, you know, that's when the uh, economy had a big crash. And that's when I very first started investing. And I went in and I put my money in and I asked my dad and my mom, I said, hey, what do you think about, you know, should, should I invest or whatever? Parents said, hey, stay away from that. You don't know what you're doing, don't invest in it. I said, okay. 
But I was like, I was kind of curious. I put my money there in 2008. As the market was crashing, my money was declining drastically, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I thought was like, man, you know what? My mom and dad was right. So I pulled my money out. Worst financial decision I had ever made. I pulled it out. It was right. I should keep it in the savings account. That's what I should do. But um, the best advice that I had received was one of my supervisors as well told me, he's like, hey, the market is crashing, but this is a great opportunity for you. You know, if you have, you got your IRA, put more money into your IRA. The economy is going to come back. Trust me, it happens. It's a cycle. I was like, well, I don't know. This is in a time where you're seeing the world like it's going to end. Unemployment is at an all-time high. Gas prices are through the roof. Uh, companies, you know, the financial industry is down. The real estate industry is down. The automobile industry is down. Is down. And you're telling me to, you know, everybody's filing bankruptcy. You remember that, right, Rick? But the thing you sit back and think about, you say, man, um, and you're telling me to invest into this? But my brain wasn't conditioned, you know, as a child. I was never taught investing. I was taught like, you know, all I, all I looked at and saw was, hey, my parents was right. So, but I did take his advice and I did start to, okay, well, I'll put more money into my IRA to see how things will come along. So as we were spending, you know, as I put more money into it and stuff like that, you know, as we know now, here it is in 20, we're in 2015 and the market has tripled itself from 2008. And as I was going through time and I was looking at this stuff, I started to wonder, I was like, wow, I wonder why, as I was, like I told you, I was going through the education and the license. I was like, well, I wonder why did my parents never teach me about investing? You know, I remember as a kid of us going to Disney World. I remember us wearing Nike, going to McDonald's, doing all these great things, right? And I said, I wonder, why did my parents never think about him and you know buying us some stock in Disney at that time or buying us you know some stock in McDonald's? I looked at the price of it back then; it was so inexpensive, two or three dollars or whatever. Why didn't they? Why didn't my parents invest for me? And I went back and asked my parents, and, and when I showed them the numbers, because you can't lie about the numbers, it's facts. When I showed it to them, they sat back and they just said, "Wow, we never." My dad just honestly said, "Son, I just I just didn't know. If I would have known, I would have done it. You know, I just." I didn't know about, you know, investing and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, he does it now, you know, for my uh, for my son, Wesley. He does it now for his grandkids. But he was just like back then. I just, you know, I just didn't know about it. So that's when I felt this. So, well, wow. What can I do to, uh, you know, because that could have changed the course of my life. You know, myself and my brothers. I was like, what can I do to put this there? Uh, put something out that can open this dialogue with parents and children to make them say, wow, this is, uh, you know, wow, you know, let's do something for our kids. Because most of us don't think about our kids' future until they're, what, junior year of high school or sophomore year? Hey, I want to send them to I school. I thought about my kids' financial future when they were born. See, that, that's a great idea. You know, that's something that I wish from the, from the date of birth. Imagine if you do it for 18 years versus two or three. And another thing is that a savings account is great. Nothing wrong with a savings account. But a thing that we have to keep in mind is inflation. You know, the, right now on Bankrate.com, yeah. the highest uh, on Bankrate.com, the highest uh, interest rate you're going to receive is 0.25. You know, that's the federal uh, high. And you look at inflation. Inflation at an average right now is like three to four uh, percent. I understand. We are really going all over. It. Yeah. And I want to <laughs> narrow down because yeah. it's a conversation. Dialed in together, Prince Alex is in studio with us and getting to know Prince and a little bit about uh, his efforts uh, with a book that is called Wesley Learns to Invest. But you can also find Prince uh, also on uh, YouTube uh, channels and uh, and also folks can see you there, right? Yes, definitely. Uh, www.youtube.com slash Royal Financial Investment Group uh, is, has over about 130 something videos up. So, 130 plus 130 plus wow. videos you know from a, a lot of tutorials to uh commentary to you know me talking back and forth uh, uh you just see me grow over time you know yeah. so the people who see me over time you know they, they see me start out to now so uh it's definitely a, a great channel i think you know and uh, i think it's over 2000 i think it was over 2400 subscribers now I'm going towards 2500 that's mm -hmm. the next uh uh that's the next um, goal there, and um, right. I definitely would like people to go in and check it out and hit the subscribe button and uh, check out some of the great videos. So, well, let's let's start with a, a little bit of basics too, and that has to do with the book. Wesley learns to invest, mm -hmm. uh, understand the motivation, which is to educate and propel. Mm -hmm. Your son Wesley is how old again? 
right now he's four years old now. Right. And in the book he's going to be ten. So it just to make it a little bit understandable that you know you can talk to the way the ten year olds are interacting with his father to make it make more sense. I made him grow up a little bit to the age of ten. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's in the book now. And he's he's four years old. I wanted to have him here, but he has to go to school. So right, right, right. <laughs> he has to go to school. But uh, he's in, he's in the book. He's ten years old, and I think it's I think it's a great book. I, I haven't seen anything out there like it, and um, you know I think people will enjoy it. What's the, the, the basics in the beginning of the book? How do, you, how do you set up the conversation about investing, especially, and mm -hmm. through the eyes of a 10 year old? Uh, I set it up uh, from, you know, what every kid, you know, the only thing they see the value in money is spending it on something. Like, hey, with this money, I can go buy this toy, this game, this bicycle, whatever it is. So he it starts off with him asking his dad for something. Like, hey, dad, I would like to buy this video game, right? And when you go out and you purchase that video game, it's his dad sits down and says, hey, well, you know, for example, you know, like a video game like PlayStation, you look at that and you say, well, son, you know, who makes that video game? Oh, Sony does. Okay, well, if you think about it, well, you have Sony, you know that people invest in the Sony. Say, how does people invest in the Sony? Well, Sony sells stocks. Well, how does he sell, you know, what are stocks and how do you buy them? And you go into explaining what a mm -hmm. stock is. And, you know, hey, the more of those video games that this company sells, the more money they make. And the kid is like, wow, so I can I can make money from, you know, them selling video games? Yes. And I explained to him, I say, son, look, today, this video game costs $400. Two years from now, it'll be worth $200. Three years from now, it'll be worth $100. Four years from now, you probably won't be able to give it away. So, but I said, hey, but you can invest into the company. And now the company share is, you know, company stock may be $50 a share, but you can take $50 a share and two years from now it could be worth $60, $100, or, you know, $200 or whatever. Then, you know, and then it gets into the story of, you know, stocks like uh, in real life, like Verizon and AT&T and all these other companies. Like, yeah, a lot of them pay dividends. They pay 4% dividends, 3% dividends. And it's companies that you and I definitely know about from Ford to Verizon to, this is a, a lot of them out there that pay dividends. And I, you know, I go ahead and I explain to him uh, what the stock is, then what a dividend is. You know, they end up, uh, the father and son, they end up, he, he, he writes out a plan of him to um, save his money because he uh, picks up leaves for donations and he recycles bottles and cans for money. And his dad tells him, hey, you can take this money that you use to recycle and you can buy yourself a couple of shares. And when they, when they, uh, when he saves up the money, he comes back to his dad. His dad is happy that he saved up all this money, so his dad decides, "Hey, I'm going to go in with you. We're going to invest together." And they sit down, and you know, he picks out some companies. He's got a little funny way of finding companies that he likes, but he he, he picks out companies that he likes, and they invest together. And I, and I think that's a a great thing that will open up a, a dialogue for people to sit down and speak about and say hopefully when they read this book and they close it it's not just a children's book you know yes it's colorful and it has illustrations but you know when the parent is reading that to the child they can you know make them think of themselves and say wow I didn't think of that you know maybe I can you know the things you know that I'm buying may not mean anything in the future like uh, I give you one example uh, he just had his fourth birthday in March right and uh, my wife decided, hey, we want to go to Chuck E. Cheese, celebrate his birthday. Mm -hmm. And when we have the birthday, you know, that's when we spend a lot of money. I think on average, they say the average parent spends $300 on a child's birthday. And I was thinking about what I was, what I was going to buy. And I'm like, okay, what, can I, what am I going to buy him? He has, tons of, he has tons of toys. He has all this other stuff. And then I just thought about it. I was like, well, you know what? I can buy him a couple of shares of a company. You know, open, he has a custodian account. I could buy him a couple of shares of a company and just let it sit there. So that's what I did. And, you know, three, four months from now, I mean, that particular position, that company is up 40%. Now, everything that he got in March, all the toys and gifts, they're sitting in the garage. You know? <laughs> but, I, I mean, how does a child react when you say at four years old, hey, guys, guess what? Uh, I got my son this wonderful <laughs> stock in at and and unwrap that yeah. you know. um, so that, that that could be a little bit interesting well it's that it's a balance you know like in, in the book I don't tell him hey take all your money and invest I say hey have fun but think about your future as well mm -hmm. hey have a Christmas have a birthday enjoy yourself but hey put a little something back 
You know, instead of spending $400 on Christmas, let's do $200 and put $200 back for the future. Because yes, that kid is going to love those presents today, but when he turns 18 or 20 and he turns into me, he's going to look back and say, Dad, why didn't you buy me this? I can't wear those shoes and toys and stuff like that anymore. But I want a car now. I want to go to school. I want to do this. I want to buy real estate. I want to do all this other stuff like that. So I think that, you know, it'll be something that'll be more appreciative in the future and teaching kids to have that long-term view instead of the short-term right. gratification. So. so I did a thing with our kids. Mm -hmm. Got a three tray, plastic, mm -hmm. and at the top is save, share, spend. Wow. 40% to save, 20% mm -hmm. to share, mm -hmm. and 20% uh, to spend. So you can save your 40 and you can share with you know either a church or with friends or to be generous. And then you could save 20, you know, use 20% of that for you to spend so you can have, you know, you earned it or it's yours and do it as you will. And so my hope at that point was to have that as a habit. Mm -hmm. So when the paychecks come in or when something comes in, there's a natural inclination to say, all right, I, I, I can put in my tray and that and the other. That seems to be resonating with the kids who are now 11 and 14. Oh, now, so. I think that's great because, you know, most of us, when we think about pay, we spend first, then we save last. We pay ourselves last. We're like, okay, we spend, okay, well, I have this much left and I guess I'll save this if we do that. And I think that's great that you tell them, hey, pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. You know, take whatever it is, whether it's an IRA or whatever you're investing into. And it's just, I tell people, it's not just stocks, you know. Uh, you have real estate, you have um, your own business, you have plenty of things that you can do, but you have to put your money into something that's gonna grow in the future. It's that, you know, we all know what an asset and a liability is. It's that when you get paid and you put everything into a liability, how do you think you're gonna grow in the future? You know, if everything you just brought was just, is going to lose value, what what did you put your money where it can possibly grow or at least stay the same? The name of the so. book is Wesley Learns to Invest. We're going to be back with uh, Prince Dykes. Since we're talking about investing and curious folks uh, always like to know, where do you find uh, for yourself that you prefer to invest? Are you more stocks or bonds or mutuals or... Um, I'm a little bit all over the place, you kind of say, but uh, I like to get involved in things that I know about and things that I use every single day. You know, I know some people have their own investing way, but um, I'm, a, you know, I'm very big into diversifying yourself to, you know, uh, if you're going to invest into stocks or whatever, you can get into an index. You know, I have some index funds. Um, I do use mutuals and I also pick individual stocks and um, option trade as well. So it's just a lot of tools out there that you can uh, put places, you know, put, you know, put your money at to diversify yourself. So, you know, so you can less, you know, lessen the risk mm -hmm. over time. So you diversify yourself. Do you uh, day trade? I don't particularly day trade. Um, I, when I buy a stock, it's, it's long term. Oh. You know, I buy a stock, it's long term. I mean, option trade daily. You know, I do option trading and uh, for income at time and stuff like that when I, I predict a move is going to come in the market or a particular stock but uh, I don't get in every day and yeah particularly day trade there's a, a the kind of, we chatted a little bit about real estate before where there's that mm -hmm. a lot of folks prefer stocks a lot of folks believe real estate uh, in your opinion the greatest wealth creator uh, for an investor mm -hmm. would be I would say real estate <laughs> You know, you look over time, but if you look at the top 1%, that's who you have to follow a lot, a lot of times. You look at them, most of them have real estate. One, they have real estate, they have their own business, and they're in the market, you know, some type of way, you know, they have a fund or they're in, they're in the stocks as well. So I look at people and I say, hey, try to conquer all three, get into real estate. If you've got your own business you want to do, mm -hmm. knock yourself out and get into the market as well. Yeah. So, you know. When we uh, talk about different uh, uh, levels of investment, mm -hmm. At what point would one consider themselves to be quote unquote eligible? Because there's some folks that would say, Oh no. I got twelve dollars and forty cents in my pocket. What are you telling me to invest? Yeah. What do you advise folks to get started? My 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 personal opinion is that, you know, first of all, if you can, you know, eliminate your debt, you have to get out of debt first. You know, like your your credit cards and stuff like that, because if you got an investment that is making ten percent annually, which is good, but your credit card debt is fifteen to twenty percent then you're actually going in a whole 5% every, every month. So the best way to make money, the quickest way to make money is to pay off your credit card, is to get out of debt. So that money is coming back into your pocket now. 
So people are like, hey, where, where's the way I can get the fastest return? I'm like, get out of debt if you can. So, you know, you can't walk around and have, you know, a, a big credit card balance and looking to invest at the same time. So my advice would be to get out of debt first. Once you get out of debt, save up for an emergency fund. Once you have yourself an emergency fund, then you look into investing. Because I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in it's nowhere around investing. You have to get invested some type of way, somehow. It don't have to be stocks. It don't have to be real estate. It could be taking yourself to school, investing into yourself, investing into a company or something. So I definitely believe you got to get involved. But carrying some level of debt isn't necessarily evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, you know, like we say, it's a good debt and bad debt. You know, it's, of course, you know, we live in America where, you know, a lot of houses out here, what, 400, 500,000? And the average American is probably not going to pay that off. Having a mortgage is one thing because at the end of the day when you have a house, a house can actually appreciate in value over time. It may be a short term, you know, because every month you're paying out into your mortgage. So some people may look at it and say, hey, I'm paying into a mortgage, I'm losing money. But the thing is, over time, that house can gain value. So I don't look at it as like, hey, this is a, a, a big debt that I got to get rid of. It's little stuff like, you know, the, the little credit cards and the little things that you pick up and or whatever, or the little loans that you just took out for whatever reason. Those are things that need to be um, taken care of immediately because those things are definitely not going to make you money over time. Well, that's, that could affect cash flow, etc. Mm -hmm. et but also, I think you're speaking to just getting started. Mm -hmm. um, and I told you about with the kids and my directive to them, and it's mm -hmm. all about maintaining a good credit score and understanding what a credit score is and, and all the different things that affect that particular number and the differentiation between FICO and some of the you know, website numbers. And it, you have to be really Akamai about the management of your credit because mm -hmm. without it, you're not going to be able to get into <laughs> some of the great opportunities that exist. That's, that's, that's very true. And, and I, that's great that you're having a conversation with your kids about credit because, and another thing you can do with credit, you know, with kids is that um, I've seen it done. I mean, my son is not to the age yet to where parents, when they get to a certain age, they add their kids. Some banks will let them add their kids to their credit card. Mm -hmm. And they add their kids, but they won't tell the kid. The kid doesn't know. And they'll just keep using that. And what that does is it builds credit. Like for me, for a prime example, I remember uh, I went to go get my first cell phone. I had no credit. I have never used credit before. I went to get my first cell phone. It was like, okay, well, you got to put $500 down and you got to pay the phone. I almost paid like $1,000 just to get a, a basic cell phone. And that came from me not having any credit history. So, and what I had to do to build my credit, I went out and I took out a... Uh, personal like little small loans like like four hundred dollars five hundred dollars because in order to build credit you must use it mm -hmm. you know you just can't say that's how you see these people that are multi-millionaires that have a 500 credit score because they don't use the you know they don't actually use the, the, the credit they use the cash they're using mm -hmm. cash and hey i got the cash to do it or whatever and if you don't use your credit you're going to lose it mm -hmm. you know so you it's kind of it sounds kind of crazy you have to put yourself into debt in order to build that uh credibility to that hey this person will pay their bills back Cause just because you have a lot of money doesn't mean that you will pay your debtors like you're supposed to. So, yeah. well, the only thing I can just experience is if there's one thing you look at, and the late payments on is an obvious thing, mm -hmm. but it's the uh, ratio of uh, percentage of debt to available credit. Yes, got to keep that low, and you got to maintain it, but you got to use it. Mm -hmm. And the advice I've received is that if you if you maintain it about thirty percent, mm -hmm. that's not a bad figure. If you can be a little less, great. But I mean, that has a big effect. So if you have available credit, don't max it out because mm -hmm. that's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And then you kick in with the interest rates on whatever that debt might uh, add on to that. And that's that's true because if you have a, let's say you have a credit card and you have $10,000 on it and you're using your credit, uh, your balance is $9,000, 9500 mm -hmm. that let creditors know, you know, hey, this person is using all of their credit, you know, maybe they don't know how to manage it. You know, but having a credit card is not a bad thing. And like I told you earlier, my parents said, stay away from credit cards. And I said, okay, cool. And that was pretty bad advice because I that's the best way to build credit if you're responsible. Yeah. So I was I always, that was the, the good thing that I always had good, I always, you know, anybody that know me know that I've been pretty good with uh, managing money and being frugal. And that was one of the uh, great things that I did was I just sat back and, you know, used the credit card responsibly, paid it off every single month. I use them, built the credit and stuff like that. There we go. Prince Dykes in studio. How can folks reach you, Prince? 
Uh, they can reach me on my website, www.royalfinancials.com. My website, uh, they can hit me up on Facebook, www.facebook.com slash Royal Financial Group. Uh, like we spoke about the YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash Royal Financial Investment Group. Or they can uh, head over to grab the book. It's available now. Wesley Learns to Invest over at lulu.com, www.lulu.com. They can, uh, it's available now for order for hard copy and soft copy. And next week it'll be available electronically for electronic download and, and Twitter at Royal Financials. And that's, that's the best way to contact us. And it's 949 uh, heading into the uh, home stretch. We'll be back with more uh, right after this. Talking with uh, Prince Dykes today and uh, talking all about uh, investments and strategies and advice, but more importantly, about Wesley Learns to Invest. And just curious, in your own family, uh, are people taking your advice and, and jumping in with their own children and all that? Yes, I have a lot of people that you know, say, man, you know, I never really, uh, I, I've taken back taken by how many people are surprised I show them the numbers I'm like well you know these are the numbers of you know the different companies and they are looking at things totally different now you know uh, as far as my my brother with his nephew he sits back and he says man you know what man I brought over these last 12 years I put so much money into Nike with him and you know from Christmas and to you know the EA Sports you know all these different companies I have put so much money into of just making sure his Christmas worthwhile but, you know, now he's 12 and man, I haven't really thought about, you know, getting him an account and how could I put some of that money back and, you know, how this could add up in the future. And it's shaping a lot of ways that uh, people are looking at, you know, finances in their kids. And, you know, we, we all know uh, the kids are our future. Whatever they get in, whatever they start investing into now, whatever they are, whatever is popular with them now, it's probably going to be popular in the future. So yeah. people are definitely uh, looking into it. What's the role of government in regard to investing, and why should we be aware of that at all? Uh, what the government is, you know, when I go back and I look at 2008 and I see how everything was handled. You had companies like Ford, you had companies like, you know, the auto industry just collapsed. You had, um, yeah, but Ford mm -hmm. played it different. Yeah, they, they, they did play a little different, but when you... When you see, they, they rejected any and all of the federal bail mm -hmm. That's true. But what the government started to do was um, the Federal Reserve started pumping money into the uh, stock market to stimulate the economy. And when I seen how the government, you know, they got involved and said, hey, we're going to fix this and how they started pushing the market up and stuff like that, you know, it started to take away my um, fear because I thought like, hey, the market goes down, maybe nobody would care, you just lose everything. But it just seen how America came together and push this market back up to say, hey, you know, because the stock market is the heartbeat of our finances. You know, without it, nobody else is going anywhere because we saw it, you know, from real estate to auto industry, everybody, you know. So with the uh, bailouts, and I think they handled it pretty well of getting the market back up. And you look at the numbers and you say, man, you know, from 2008 to now, we made a pretty big turnaround. You just look at the, the numbers itself. So. Well, there were, there were some, I recall at that time, that were also of the mind of saying, let it go. Mm -hmm. uh, using GM as an example, uh, GM through their own management practice with their management mm -hmm. with, with the UAW and really the management uh, capitulating to the union demands over a period of time that priced them almost literally out of the market and through those negotiations GM became one of the largest corporate healthcare providers <laughs> because of the incredible amount of benefits that were negotiated and they, they acquiesced to uh, the unions. And many would say, well, listen, you know, you got yourself in this predicament. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to build in X amount of dollars in order to take care of health care. I think it came out to $750 <laughs> per automobile in order to take care of benefit packages and things. You guys did this. Why should we step up, et cetera, et cetera? So I, I recall those mm -hmm. conversations. And as with most things, uh, everything is not necessarily cut and dry. Mm -hmm. So, but that said, it, uh, yeah, it was a very interesting time. And the reason why, you don't want to have a company think it's too big to fail. And then when, when a company says, hey, I'm too big to fail, I can do whatever I want, then, you know, they won't be as responsible. You know, if you, for example, you got a small business or you got a company, you're going to be very cognizant of where you put your money and where you obligate yourself because you're like, hey, I could lose everything if I make a bad move. But, you know, if a company thinks like, hey, pfft, I can just go out here and make all these bad obligations and put out these bad loans and... If something goes wrong, I hop on my private jet and get to DC and they're gonna bail me right back out and I'm gonna fly back and keep doing these same irresponsible things. 
that was the language of 2008 when people were saying, hey, we don't want these companies to think they're too big to fail, you know, that why are we just going to bail them out just for being irresponsible on their end? Are we going to take the American tax dollars and pump them up? We don't want to put in their minds of, hey, you can't do any wrong. We're always here to bail you out when you need to be bailed out. So I know that was the opposing side's view of it. You know, I know the other side was like, hey, we employ too many people. We do too much for the economy for us to collapse, you know, so. Yeah, we're going to have to have another hour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That old premise, uh, oh, I remember back in the day, I, I would recoil it, <laughs> a lot of that. But bottom line is, uh, it's all about finance. It's about being educated and being able to really navigate through a modern society to where finance, personal or otherwise, is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the name of the book, Prince, is? Wesley Learns to Invest. And where can we find it uh, starting today? Starting today, www.lulu.com. That's L-U-L-U.com. You can go ahead and order the book, hard copy, or you can order the soft copy today. There you go. And uh, your website is? www.royalfinancials.com. And I also want to let you know, next month, the book will be available on Barnes & Noble. It will be available on um, Amazon, iBook, and Nook. There we have it. Chris, thanks a lot for today. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. We'll be back tomorrow and hope you will too. Thanks to Jessica, thanks to you. It's the Rick Mata program. We'll see you.